Welcome to Plaid for Women TV, your go-to resource for the business of life. Whether the CEO of your home or your own business, women struggle with the same challenges. At Plaid TV, we discuss real-life issues affecting real women and offer solutions to help you achieve your goals, get connected, and be heard. Together, we will change the world. Let's do this. No mean girls allowed. Hey, welcome everybody to Plaid for Women TV. I'm Siobhan Palmer. We're continuing our conversation in this segment on elder law issues. My guest is Ms. Karen Telshow Johnson. She's an attorney with Telshow Johnson Law Firm in Fort Worth, Texas. Karen, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'm very interested in this next topic. Very, very critical information for those of us um, with elderly uh, family members. Let's talk about making medical decisions for our loved ones. Um, medical powers of attorney are only effective when the patient can no longer communicate. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Importantly, what people don't realize is that as long as someone can communicate, medical powers of attorney are not effective at all. And so even if mom or dad or even a neighbor is talking about the sky being purple and birds, you know, flooding their kitchen, as long as they can communicate, there's no medical power of attorney that can come into play and, and, and be effective for them. So wow. most importantly, uh, I had a client that uh, was end stage uh, dementia, white brain matter um, dysfunction. And so what was happening to her was happening over a five, six year period of time. And so we were getting to the very end and, and they knew at some point she would need to be in a memory care facility. And so the daughter went to the house one August and mom hadn't liked the sound of the air conditioning. So she just shut everything off. So the daughter walks into the house. And it's like 120 degrees and the mom's just, you know, she's not in, in good state either. So they go to the hospital, get her hydrated, get everything, um, you know, get her back in, in fairly good condition. And then they had talked about the memory care facility. They had been talking about it for years. Yeah. They knew which one. She knew which one she was probably going to go to. They had been signed up already. And so then they, they called and said, okay, now's the time, ready to go. Right. So mom, had, had they had gone back to the house and she packed up her suitcase and all her personal belongings and went to the facility mm -hmm. and had her room ready. And she decorated and got out all her things and put out all her little tchotchkes. And, and then mom said, gosh, this is going to be really nice for the person I'm preparing this for. And she said, no, Mom, yeah, this, this is, is your you. room. You're yeah. gonna be here, and then we're gonna. Uh, I'll be back mm -hmm. tomorrow, and you know you're gonna meet a lot of new friends. She goes, "Oh no, dear, I am not staying. I, I'm going home." And there was nothing the facility can do about it, regardless of the fact she had end stage um, dementia. She had end stage, end stage, yes, because she can still effectively communicate. The state or the facility has to recognize that request? Correct. Wow. Yes. And now, is so, that across the board? Is that only in the state of Texas or is that across the United States That right is now? not necessarily across the United States. It's not. So it's very haphazard as to which states have that okay. and which states have But in most cases, it, it you don't want anybody making medical decisions for you as long as you can talk to the doctor. Sure. So that's just a shouting match. But legally, as far as for the safety of the person, if you were going to have to go to that level where you were going to have to physically make decisions and restrain somebody, right. then you have to engage the state and file for guardianship uh, of the guardianship of the person. She didn't need guardianship of the estate, um, but in this particular case, we were talking about guardianship of the person because the medical power of attorney had it had no effect as far as for what they needed to make sure that she did stay safe. So guardianship of the person would have negated her request to go home, and then she would have had to stay in because the facility. Because the daughter having that guardianship power gotcha. would have yeah, terrific. kept her there. Okay, now let's talk about advanced directives addressing end-of-life issues. Advanced directives in the state of Texas are varied. The most commonly used one is one used in the hospital setting. It's a directive to physicians. Okay. Um, it's used once you're intubated. You cannot communicate. You're in a CCU or an ICU setting. And a physician has certified that you are about to die of either a terminal condition such as cancer or an irreversible condition such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. People don't technically die of those diseases. Those are post-mortem 
um, diagnosis. And so, but they do have complications from those diseases. Related, so yeah. those are considered, also car accidents, those are considered irreversible conditions, not necessarily terminal. So the law distinguishes between the two on the statutory form. And so what you do is you initial by your choice as to whether or not you want to be withdrawn um, from an intubation or you want to remain intubated until the end of, until the end. And so the advanced directive is where the patient gets to make the decision as to what they want at the end of their life. And so what I tell people, and it's most important for people to understand is, the medical power of attorney is not the agent that you appoint to pull your plug. Okay. They don't get to do that. You are never going to be, be responsible for saying, hey, you get to pull the plug on your husband and you get to pull the, pull, pull the plug on your wife. When you think about it from a legal perspective, the state of Texas and no state really wants you to be legally responsible for anybody else's death. That's that, exactly That right. doesn't make sense. It's kind of contraindicated. Um, at the same time, people take comfort in knowing that they get to make their own decisions at the end of their life, not burdening any of their family members. Right. Now, where you hear about the battles and the hang wringing and do we have to pull the plug and things like that is when there are no papers in place. The Texas Health Code statutes have defaults. And so it's usually it's nearest living relative okay. is the default when there are no papers in place who get to have a larger role in that decision-making process. But most patients don't want to have their family member have that responsibility. You know, it's interesting, uh, a topic that's come up as people continue to age and they want more control over their quality of their life. What is the uh, current status in terms, I know Oregon is one of the few states in this country where people have the right to end their own life from a legal standpoint. Do you see that issue becoming more and more prevalent as people age longer and they're in pain and they want a little bit more control over how they leave this earth? I think people are going to move to the state of Oregon. <laughs> I think, I think that this issue became more prevalent in the national conversation where that young woman was diagnosed with brain cancer in her early 20s, had just gotten married and basically was given six to 12 months and just a horrible, horrible disease process and said, this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to end my life, was given the medication and then chose her date. And, they and had did to move that. to Oregon to actually do it legally, right? Right. And so... That issue in the state of Texas is not going to, I don't see it coming to the forefront any anytime soon. Um, it, but I do see it becoming an issue regarding your having your own say over how your body is, is going to function at the end it of your life. It definitely opened that, up the conversation. That whole quality versus quantity mm -hmm. is a really big issue. Huge and so, issue. But, I, but here's what I encourage people to do. I encourage people to talk to your family members about it. I encourage people to say at Thanksgiving, everybody get a glass of wine or a beer, sit down at the table and have the conversation as to what you want. Right. And so I had most of my family members were like me. If we can't walk, talk, and shoot gum at the same time, that's it. Pull the plug, we're good. Um, and I can't really do that now, so that kind of concerns me. But, <laughs> um, but then I had a family member say, absolutely, if there's a cell of life left in my body, you will keep me Email plugged me. in. Now, that said, Texas does have, and it's not mentioned in the documents, but it happens a lot, a 10-day futility rule. Now, what does futility mean? Futility means that there is no treatment that is going to be curative for the patient any longer. Okay. That the patient is dying, and um, it became more prevalent in dealing with NICU. And now it's becoming prevalent in dealing with end-of-life issues for, for older adults and then for, for accident victims. And I did have somebody, a client's, um, a, a client's relative go through that recently, and it was just not pleasant. But right. what happens is, is at some point, the physician says there is no treatment left available that is going to be curative. And so we're in a palliative state, and we're giving you 10 days where you have the decision to either move them to a facility that will accept them, or in 10 days we're removing all treatment. Right. And so that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's a hard thing for a family to have to deal with. But. You know, as we wrap up this on making medical decisions, one of the things we really need to talk about is the humanity of the person that we're dealing with, the patient. Mm -hmm. This is a human being, and I know depression plays a huge role in an aging population as they see their facilities and a loss of control and people making decisions for them. So talk about how depression ties into all of this. It very much blankets decision-making authority. And so I, I encourage everybody to get these papers in place now 
so that they accurately reflect what your wishes are when you can no longer express what your wishes are. And so the other thing is, is that for these patients and for the elderly, I cannot tell you how many times I have seen somebody walks in with white hair or gray hair or what have you, and their kids talk to me. They're, you know, 60-year-old kids, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. are talking to me about their 80 and 90-year-old parent. And I'm like, they raised you and they're sitting right there. So let's all have the conversation. Absolutely. But all of us need to be included in the conversation. They raised you. And I understand your perspective of, you know, really having to take care of things now. But we need to include them in the conversation. The respect issue. The respect issue. Mm-hmm. And so I I impart that into my clients so that it's important to understand those dynamics. Right. Because the child that's sitting in front of me is not necessarily mom's favorite. And so I have to make sure that I have the conversations with everybody separately and together. Mm -hmm. But they need to be having the conversations among themselves first, and they need to do it in a respectful manner. Absolutely. Take the emotion out of it and be pragmatic. Karen, another great session. Fantastic information on making medical decisions. Um, Again, why don't you tell our audience how they can get a hold of you to get more information on this important topic? Great. Thank you. My email is Karen at tjlawpllc.com and the website is www.tjlawpllc.com. Karen, thank you so much. This is fantastic information. Thank you. This is Siobhan Palmer with Plan for Women TV talking about elder care issues. We appreciate you watching and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching Flood TV. See you next time.